Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. Okay, we're continuing in our series on the uh, book of Acts, the beginning of the journey. The title of my message this morning is to expect trouble. I don't think when I wrote it that I was predicting what would come today, but it certainly seems to have been uh, a prediction. We began chapter 8 last week, where we saw Saul appeared to be more than just a coach check guy. Remember this, Dr. Luke tells us that as they stoned Stephen, that they laid their coats with Saul. It appears that he was the instigator, or I would probably term him the prosecutor, the one that actually caused the group to say, we need to kill him, and then orchestrated his execution. It appears that he then goes on, and as we'll see in chapter 9, he murders and arrests Christians. That's the Apostle Paul that we're talking about. Persecution in Jerusalem caused the church to be pushed out. Last week, the title of our message was being pushed, as the church was being pushed out of Jerusalem, into the surrounding areas, into Judea and Samaria, keeping with the direction of Jesus, who said, you'll be witnesses for me in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. One of the men that had we had been introduced to in chapter 6 was Philip. Of course, we were introduced to Stephen as he was with Philip, appointed a deacon, seven men that had been appointed by the apostles to be deacons to help the widows get their daily distribution of food. And last week we saw that Philip was pushed out of Jerusalem and he went up to Samaria. He was preaching and performing miracles. God used Philip to heal the sick, cast out demons, and perform all sorts of miracles. Resulted in a gathering crowd in Samaria. Everybody was coming to see what was going on as Philip was there. This morning we pick up Dr. Luke's narrative in chapter 8, verse 9. Dr. Luke continues the narrative of Philip in Samaria. And he also talks about something else that happened there in Samaria. So we'll have a brief break in the narrative of Philip, but we're still in Samaria, and it's in response to what Philip had seen and what God had done through him. Starting in chapter 8, verse 9. But there was a man named Simon, who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. We saw last week that there was much joy in Samaria because of the gospel, because of all the miracles that were happening, that were being conducted. One of the people affected by the gospel was a man that was involved in witchcraft, Simon. Our English text uses the word uh, magic. But the Greek word's meaning ranges from sorcery to witchcraft. We're not talking David Blaine magic here. We're not talking about card tricks. We're talking about witchcraft. We're talking about dark arts, whatever you want, whatever word you want to use for occult practices. That's what we're talking about here. This was not a good guy. This was a bad guy sense of the word is that he was involved in using supernatural powers, Satan's powers. I'm struck by the contrast of verses 7 and 8, and with the, with being then contrasted with verse 9. Look at the verses with him. 
Going back to what we saw last week. For unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who, who had them. Many who, are, were, who were paralyzed or were lame were healed. So there was much joy in the city. Okay, 7 and 8. Philip, working in the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 9, which we had just previously read. But there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying, Look at me, I'm a good guy. What's the difference? The difference is one's focused on serving God, and one's focused on serving himself. In verses 7 and 8, God used Philip to perform miracles, healing and casting out demons, resulting in great joy in the city. And in verse 9, Satan's supernatural power was being used to glorify Simon. It was all about him. Look at me, I'm a good guy. All attention was focused on Simon and on how great he was. But for Philip, they were focused on God. So here's my first of my interactive questions today. What principle do you see here in the juxtaposition of 7 and 8 with 9? Okay, one, one had a purpose of spreading the gospel. False prophets, false teachers, yeah. What's the principle? You guys are making observations. Okay, that's good. We should be more like Philip and less like, like uh, Simon. God can use anybody, okay. Okay. Where should we get our power from? I see a couple of principles here. First, whenever the gospel is presented, Satan's going to work against it. All you got to do is come here on a Sunday morning and look at how our electronics are working. Because I guarantee when I, when I come here during the week and I work on stuff, everything's fine. Sunday morning, I've said many times, Satan doesn't care about you if you're doing nothing to serve God. If Satan hasn't visited you and caused you problem, my guess is you're not doing anything for God. Because once you get busy doing stuff for God, Satan's going to, oh, to quote our granddaughter, we have a problem here. Something's not right. That's Satan when he sees you working for God. And he's going to do what he can to disrupt that. When you get serious about serving God, just expect trouble. That's the title of the message today. Expect trouble. If you're not expecting it, you're not experiencing it, logic would dictate that you're not doing anything for God. The more God uses you, the more Satan's going to be after you. It might be pain in the knees. It might be getting really physically sick. It might be having a car crash. It might be losing your house in a fire. It could be any number of things that God can do to you. Or that I should say Satan that can do to you. Remember that Satan only can do what God allows him to do. So just think about that. If your life is as good as it gets, take inventory of yourself. Are you serving God or not? Second, I see that Satan can make people think he's God. Or at least God adjacent. Satan's a great imposter. He can make people think that they're doing or what they're doing and what they're saying is from God, when in reality, it's from Satan. He's a great counterfeit God. As a result of both of these principles, we need to be prepared for trouble when we serve Jesus. I suspect that when Satan, I'm sorry, when Stephen and Philip were appointed to wait tables in Jerusalem, 
they had no idea what their fate was. When they started working as deacons in the early church, I don't think either Stephen or Philip had the idea of what was going to happen with them. In the case of Stephen, it meant that he was in the presence of Jesus really quickly. He's out there pr pronouncing the gospel, and he gets rocked to sleep. This took a little longer for Philip. Back to our text. Acts 8.10, they all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the power of God that is called great. Simon was doing miracles. He was doing counterfeit miracles in the power of Satan. The entire city was focused on him and how great he was. Satan made himself and his servant Simon look good, look like God. We have to watch out for that kind of counterfeit going on in our world today. Here's your second question. When you think of counterfeits like this today, counterfeit gods going on today. Let's hear them. Black white, yeah. I'm going to go way out on, a, on an anti-NBA thing, and I'm going to say LeBron James. You want to talk about a counterfeit god? He's right there. And that's not an anti-basketball thing. That's an anti-LeBron thing. Joel Osteen, yeah. But a lot of people look at them as really high up on the list, right? They're really good guys. They're preaching thousands this morning in Houston. About 9,000 people will go to church there. And think they've been to hear God. But they, they won't hear God unless something dramatically happens. Because that's not where God is taught. Because it's your best life now. If this is as good as it gets, I'm not looking forward to it. I think there are all sorts of false teachers today. To form a spirituality that's not consistent with the Word of God. False teachers are teaching a false doctrine, claiming it to be biblical. Then there are many false religious systems all over the world that claim to be the path to eternity and sometimes to even being a God yourself. People of these systems and people see these systems and then flock to them. Because they're the power of Satan, people just are attracted to them, thinking they're following God, but in effect they're following Satan. They're being led away from God. That's Satan's goal, is to keep you from seeing God. It looks good, and the leader looks great. I mean, Joel has more money in one suit coat than I have in my entire wardrobe. Probably all of the wardrobe I've ever had is less than the cost of his suit. He looks good. People follow him. He sounds good. There's no theology. Whip. He doesn't hear God. He doesn't preach God. And there are a lot of guys out there like that. Not just to pick on Joel Olson. Although, Because he's so popular, but he's so anti-biblical theology. Those kinds of things are Satan servants. They're actually drawing people away from following God. Verse 11. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. Read witchcraft. Read sorcery. Okay. Don't think of magic as, as in David Blaine or any of those other magicians. That's not what we're talking about here. But when they believed Philip and he preached good news about the kingdom of God and in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women. Apparently Simon had been a fixture in Samaria for 
for quite some time. Everybody knew who Simon was. And they all loved him because he did things. To put it into today's world, he gave them stuff. It's like the government sending you a couple thousand dollars every few months. Get you hooked on that, you're going to like them. That's the whole intent. Simon did stuff for them. He healed them. He gave them things. He performed magic for them. Simon commanded attention in Samaria. All because of the supernatural power that was empowering him. But then Philip came along, came to town, and preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. Dr. Luke refers to the gospel as the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ. He's preaching the gospel, saved by grace, By the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. Jesus crucified, buried, and resurrected. The Messiah, the Savior. The result of Philip coming to town is many of the people that had followed Simon were now following Jesus Christ. There was a revival going on in town. Many were baptized. When I first read this, I was not sure how to treat this short statement. Many were baptized. We have to go back to the first phrase of verse 12, where we see they believed. They believed and then were baptized. All throughout the book of Acts, we see baptism as almost the first action post-salvation. Never do you see it for salvation. There's no place in the book of Acts where you have baptismal regeneration. You see baptism as a result of salvation, an identification, an identification as we understand it with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and their their, uh, part in our salvation. The sense of the word believe in the beginning of of verse 12 is much bigger, broader than than we sense it in English. In English, it is is just an understanding of you believing something. But in Greek, it's, it's more relied on, trusted, convinced of, or have faith in. It is something actionable. You know, for a while, I, uh, I uh, was involved in the, the new, I helped build or, or uh, put together the new fusion center for this region of, uh, of Florida where we would take information in from all sorts of sources, you know, whether it was uh, social media or it was uh, um, governmental information or what we're seeing, uh, what we're getting from people that we interview that have been arrested and stuff. All that information gets put together. As a result of 9-11, fusion centers have been built up all across the country. And we would get information and then we'd have to look at it. Is it actionable or is it just noise? When you believe something, it becomes actionable. You can do something with it. And we can make determination of what we were going to do as a law enforcement agency because we had intelligence or information that we believed was actionable. You could work on it. You could use it and make determination from it. That's the sense of the word believed here. Jesus gives us the ability to trust Him and act on that. It's actionable. Our faith in God to care for us and deliver us from Satan for eternity. Dr. Luke says that when Philip reached the gospel of Jesus, the Messiah, and the coming kingdom of God, the people believed. They found it actionable. They believed the message and put their faith in Jesus to save them. They became followers of Jesus. Another principal question. What's the principle here in the salvation of the people who had followed Satan, the sorcerer? The people that were following Simon, but those that they became saved when they followed Jesus. 
Okay, what's the there's a principle there. You're close. You're close. Say the first part I didn't hear. Okay, they saw the difference between uh, the truth and, and uh, false information. You're, you're building on it. You're getting there. That's good. Only God can save you. God wins, yeah. That's really the idea, that only God can save you, God wins, is that this, the power of Satan is no match for the power of God. The only problem with your argument right now is they didn't receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit at the time they were saved. So, in in our time now, that would be true because as soon as you're saved, you get the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and you feel the ability to have that power. They didn't have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit yet. We'll see that later on in the message. Because the book of Acts is a transitional period. And while the Holy Spirit immediately indwells us now, he didn't in this period. And we'll see that here in just a little bit. Right. Both men and women. Right. In fact, you can see that all throughout the church age. You know, in this, in this period of time where we have this this argument about complementarian and egalitarian. Um, uh, complementarian is the understanding where women complement. They're different from, but complement men. Or egalitarian, where a woman can do anything a man can do. In a lot of ways, that's true. But God has ordained that in the church and in the home, there's a, there's a difference. There's a different role. That's that's complementarian. But in this, as this argument of complementarian and egalitarian rages in our, in our world today, there's this idea that, that the church never looked at women as equals. That's the furthest from the truth. Always in the church, women have been looked at as equal. Different, equal. I mean, you don't know anatomy if you think we're that's just simple. I think the principle here is that that the power of Jesus is is far superior to the power of Satan. When the gospel goes out by God's power, Satan doesn't stand a chance. We need to, to apply that logic to our spread of the gospel. Why can't the world be overcome with, with the gospel because we have all the power? It's because we limit it. We're all frustrated by what's going on in our nation today with all the racial division and the various struggles. It seems like there are no answers to the problems of our society. It seems like every day you turn on the news and it's just no answer. Well, I got an answer. The gospel of Jesus Christ. Back in the late 80s, Jack Eckert, you've heard me tell this story before, Jack Eckert, the founder of Eckert Drugs, he was a, a, a great humanitarian as well as a great businessman, and he was appointed by Governor Graham of Florida to head up a commission on figuring out the recidivism, how to, how to solve the recidivism in Florida's prison. Recidivism is when a, when a prisoner is let out and comes back to to prison again. And at the end of the, uh, of the period of time of study, Jack and his commission proposed to the Florida legislature and the Florida governor that recidivism will only be reduced when we introduce prisoners to Jesus Christ. For a while, a Democrat governor in the state of Florida had as an official policy, we're going to teach people about Jesus Christ in prison. It's a different day but our recidivism rate went down. 
They actually had to close two prisons in the state of Florida for a period of time because they didn't have any bad days. Because they were being introduced to Jesus Christ until some satanic individual decided to compel the government to no longer do that. And we had to open up the prisons and build more. And the recidivism rate is still north of 70%. This country has start, was started amidst the Great Awakening of the 18th century. I love to study revivals and awakenings. As people fled Western Europe and the religious oppression going on there, people like our predecessors, Alexander Mack and, and group, fled Germany and the other Western European countries in order to find a place where they could practice what they understood God's word to say. They came to America and dramatically changed the world. Not just our predecessors, but all the people that came to, the, to North America fleeing religious oppression changed the world. The United States of America was born out of that kind of, of thought process. Then at the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century, another revival, revival occurred in the United States. This revival saw the establishment of many, many, many seminaries that became colleges, universities, that are at the top of the Ivy League today. The Ivy League didn't start off as this satanic-filled place that it is today. It started off as places where men were taught how to preach the gospel. There was a big change in, in America at the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century. There have been many other smaller revivals in this country which changed things in our country of the effect of the gospel. My prayer is that another awakening occurs in this country that leads to revival around the world. We have the only solution for false religious, the false religions of critical race theory, the false religion of intersectionality, the false religion of climate change, the false religion of evolution, and every other false religion. We have the only antidote for all of that. That's Jesus Christ on the cross. Suffering for us. Buried and resurrected. We have the solution. The solution is to get the church serious about reaching America with the gospel. Just as Philip spreading the gospel in Samaria impacted the community. So the gospel will impact America. Here's evidence of it. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip and seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. Even the servant of Satan himself believed and was baptized. As I said earlier, baptism always follows in this, in this section of, of Acts, always follows salvation. There's no way to make this a statement of baptismal regeneration. He was saved and then was baptized. I have to admit, verse 13 gives me some difficulty in the context of the passage. I remarked, remarked earlier that people who followed Simon heard the gospel and believed, trusted in Jesus to save them. I said that the Greek word has a much deeper sense than the English word believe. Dr. Luke uses the same word to talk about Simon. And contextually, if we understand that word to be trusted, believed, have faith in, and action resulted, when we're talking about the people that had believed Simon, now believed Philip, we have to use that same interpretation for the word for Simon. So when Dr. Luke says he believed, we have to believe that he was saved. Now, that's not the most popular way to translate or to interpret this passage because of what happens following. Later on, it appears Simon was only in it for the money. So, in a way, 
How do you think of Simon as being actually saved? Did he truly trust God to save him? Or did he just act like it to gain some new power? Or did Simon truly believe and then succumb to the temptation of his previous lifestyle? I think that the contextual use of the same word to describe the salvation of those who followed, um, who had previously followed Simon and now were following Jesus, and then Simon himself leads us to conclude. They were all saved, but not everyone, not everybody, not all the scholars agree with me. Clearly, though, Simon was interested in the power. Remember when you were saved, you weren't immediately, completely, and totally changed. You still have some of your old drawbacks, some of us more than others. Because that's what he knew. What he knew. Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Word reached the apostles in Jerusalem who were still there. Dr. Luke told us that before. The church is scattering, but the apostles were still there in Jerusalem. They learned that Samaria had received the gospel. And the apostles sent two leading apostles to Samaria to check things out. I'm fascinated by the fact that God sends Peter and John to Samaria. Dr. Luke recorded in Luke 9 that James and John wanted to call down fire from heaven on Samaria because they didn't respond when Jesus was in Samaria. Hey, Jesus, they didn't listen to you. Let's kill them. That's what they asked for. Let's call down fire and judgment on the city of Samaria because they didn't listen to you. And you know, if James and John were there, that Peter was there too. I mean, those guys were thick as thieves, right? They were together all the time. So they wanted to call down fire on Samaria, and now they're after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, after the church has started, after they've received the Holy Spirit, they're going to check it out and see if the gospel really works for them. I just wonder what the conversation was like as they were walking down from Jerusalem to Samaria. Take a day or so to walk. What was the conversation like? Peter said, hey, do you remember when you guys were calling down fire? Because Dr. Luke doesn't say Peter was involved in that, so he, he could throw stones at him for that. Do you remember when you wanted them to be dead? Now they're turning to Jesus. I just wonder how that conversation went. I wonder if they regretted how they acted before. Once in Samaria, Peter and John prayed for the Samaritans that they would receive the Holy Spirit. We're still early in the church age. We're still in that transition. The Old Testament, the, old, the, the age of law, isn't quite done away with. The New Testament, or the, I'm sorry, the, the, the church age is, is ramping up. We have this transitional period. And things aren't happening exactly like they happen now. They hadn't yet received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It's not the same word, the same idea. Yeah. It, don't confuse fallen upon with how the Old Testament uses came upon. Think fallen upon as indwell. It, it's a different set of words, but it's the same concept. Yes. So they're praying that they receive the Holy Spirit. And then they do. This is not a second blessing. 
Charismatic churches will tell you this is evidence of a second blessing. It's, we're very clearly told they had not yet received the Holy Spirit. This is the receiving of the Holy Spirit. It's different than it does than it happens today. Understand that. This is a transitional time, and what happens for them is not normative of what happens in the church. It's not the way it normally works in the church age. But it's in a transition age. Now that I've got you really thinking about that transition, here's a good question for you. Why do you think God set up a transitional period? I get asked this question every once in a while when we have this topic. The, the transitional period as the church age is beginning. I don't think Mickey Mouse has anything to do with the transition period. Just, just saying. Part of the validation process. Right on top of it, Ann, like usual. I think there's a couple of reasons. First, by the Holy Spirit not being received until the apostles and prayed with the Samaritans, there's a connection or a link between the church in Jerusalem and now this new church in Samaria. The apostles during this apostolic period are the link. So what's the link now? The Holy Spirit was given. Then. What's the link now? Back to the apostles. Exactly. Scripture. Scripture is the link now. The Holy Spirit can be given right away because we have the link of what God recorded in the New Testament. And that wasn't done until the end of the Apostolic Age, when John finished the book of uh, Revelation in about 90-95. He is soon dead after that. The Apostolic Age comes to an end. The writing of the New Testament comes to an end. And now we have a link. You want to know what the apostles understood? Read the New Testament. In light of the Old Testament. They didn't have that luxury at this time. You want to link this back to the apostles who are the direct link to, the, to uh, Jesus, the head of the church? You're going to have to talk to one of the apostles because they hadn't yet written the New Testament. So I think this transitional period is all about the establishment of God's Word. We have those sign miracles, as we talked about earlier. We have those sign miracles during this transitional period because we didn't yet have the completion of God's Word and we didn't yet have a fully functioning way of the Holy Spirit to talk to us through God's Word and through the people that have been trained, and the people that are around us. And so the system God would use for the rest of the church age comes in place by the end of the book of Acts. God indwells, the Holy Spirit indwells us at the time of salvation. No longer do we have to build a link back to the apostles. Verse 17. Then they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Peter and John laid hands on the people and they received the Holy Spirit. This is one of those descriptive passages, but it's also prescriptive. Dr. Luke is describing what happened, not the way it will happen. The indwelling they received is the same as we received, it's just not timed in the same way. I should, I should, I made a, made a, a bad statement, is descriptive, not prescriptive. I said that wrong. This is not the way it has to happen. It's not the way it happened for you. The Apostle John didn't come and put his hand on you, and you received the Holy Spirit. I mean, he was old when he died, but he's not that old. The indwelling they received is the same indwelling we received. 
timed a little bit differently. And when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone whom I lay my hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. Simon, the former sorcerer, saw the coming of the Holy Spirit through the laying on of the apostles' hands and wanted that ability himself. I can't really blame him for that. He was even willing to pay the apostles for it. Simon wanted the power to give the Holy Spirit to anyone he wanted. Clearly, he didn't understand the theology going on here, but he wanted it. He was looking for something to continue his position of power and authority. Remember, everybody in Samaria was enthralled with him. And he wanted to continue that. That's natural. I don't think we automatically say he's not saved because he wanted to do what he's always done. That's part of the problem of being a baby Christian is you only know what you were, not where God will take you. And God doesn't take you normally in one step. It's a bunch of little baby steps. Throughout church history, the practice that Simon wanted is called simony. Put a Y on the end of Simon. It's a theological term for using the church for money. Simony. The buying and selling of religious office or power. In a real way, the Reformation began because of simony. Martin Luther and the others that rebelled against the Catholic Church were rebelling at the sales of indulgences. Most of the great cathedrals of Europe were paid for by the selling of salvation. At first, only the Pope could offer an indulgence. Well, then later, it became so that bishops and then priests could, could sell them also. So if you needed to build a new cathedral, you just sold some more salvation. Simony. It continues today the way televangelists work. God's going to bless you, just send me 25 bucks. Only one blessed in that is the guy asking for my book. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Peter jumps right on Simon for his request and even for his bribe. I imagine that as soon as Simon was saying it, Peter was getting cranked up. Because you know that Peter just he speaks before he thinks. And uh, he just jumped right on that. Peter said that Simon's wicked heart had no part in the spread of the gospel in Samaria. Peter told Simon that his heart was not right before God in this matter. He then told Simon to repent of this wickedness and maybe it would be possible for God to forgive him. There are some theological issues to deal with in Dr. Luke's reporting. If Simon was truly a believer, which seems likely by the context, as I argued before, then the forgiveness Peter is referring to is not for salvation. That's been dealt with. It's for the sin that came after that, of thinking that he could buy this ability. That would mean that the forgiveness here would be more focused on the relationship between Simon and Jesus. It's no different than our sinning and being estranged from God until we repent. If Simon was not a true believer, then the forgiveness Peter is talking about may include the forgiveness for eternal life. I think we can answer that question, though, by looking closely at verse 22. 
Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart be forgiven you. Peter doesn't tell Simon to believe in Jesus, but to repent of a particular wickedness. Deal with this sin that you've committed. He's not telling him how to be saved. That's done. He's telling him to repent of this wickedness. The wickedness now known as simony. The desire to be able to use the giving of the Holy Spirit. The desire to maintain position and authority and have everybody looking at I understand that. I want to be noticed too. And so I understand Simon, who is used to being in front. He doesn't want to give that up. Anybody that likes the limelight doesn't want to give it up. That's natural. So I think that's where Simon was. I should also point out that in the text, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. If possible is one word in Greek which really means not if possible, but as a result. Another one of those translations that is difficult in our modern parlance to understand. Now, if you go back to Old English and so forth, it makes a little more sense. But the way we understand it today, ESV should not have translated that if possible. Should have translated as a result. So read it that way. Read it that way. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray the Lord that as a result, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. He's not saying God might or might not forgive. He's saying as a result of your repenting, God will forgive you. Peter also remarks that he sees that Simon is the gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity. Simon spent his life practicing the occult and witchcraft. Performing miracles by the power of Satan. That's all he knew. So it seems logical that he would still turn back to that until he had grown in the Lord. Gall of bitterness is an Old Testament term often used to speak of idolatry. Gall of bitterness, Peter's saying, why are you turning back to all that idolatry? Why are you turning back to the occult? Christian, why do you still read your horoscope? Put it in today's context. Christian, why do you go to a palm reader? Palm reader? Don't do those things. We all know what we know. We all know where we've been. And when you're a brand new baby believer in Jesus, you still don't know what you don't know about Jesus but you know what you were. And so it's natural to go to the bar to celebrate being saved when you grew up in the bar. That makes perfect sense. And Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Now when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. Simon responded to Peter's words by asking for prayer that the things that Peter said wouldn't come true. He was he he didn't want the bad things to happen to him. Makes sense. I think it's an appropriate response for a new believer to say, No, I don't want that. I know that's what I asked for, but I I don't want it. Peter and John did the apostolic thing. And they preached a little and encouraged them before returning to Jerusalem. I'd like to have been present for that message. I mean, the whole city's turned upside down because of the, the, the message of Philip. And now Peter and John, the big boys, are in town. And I'd like to have heard their, their message. I wonder if it held a candle to what Philip had said. And Simon answered, pray uh, for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. I'm sorry? Either. The bad, really. Peter, Peter warned him, look, you've got to pray and you might get forgiven. 
But you got to pray that you get forgiven. You got to pray because you're going down the wrong path. Right. Right. Here's another question for you. Last one today. What do you see happened on the way back? What do you see happened as Peter and John are making their way back to, to Jerusalem? Why is that in to continue to share share the gospel? Why is that important for Peter and John to be doing that? Yeah, there, there's there's a whole bunch of, of what's happening here that is is really exciting. Dr. Luke told us before that the, that the apostles stayed in Jerusalem. God pushed them out of Jerusalem. Now they were preaching in Samaria. And as you said, they had talked about killing those folks before. So now they're looking at, hey, let's share the gospel with them. Let's put it into today's context. My friend Jim Brown, you know, you've heard the story about what happens in Goshen. And when, when we were really fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan, a lot of people, including a lot of, of Christians, just wanted to nuke the whole place. I mean, that was a meme going around on Facebook for a long time. Let's just drop a bunch of nukes. Let's just eliminate the map, right? That's not the Christian response. My friend Jim Brown, what he did, he raised a bunch of money, and he went and started a ministry in Erbil, Iraq. He bought an apartment building. They were only going to rent it for a few months. They ended up buying that building and several others. Where Christians that are hunted in that area have a place of protection and where the gospel goes out. The gospel is going out in Muslim countries faster today than at any time in history. Peter and John wanted to nuke them. Now the gospel's going. That's the reality of the work of the gospel. I think Peter and John were preaching the gospel along the way back to Jerusalem to illustrate that God was in control, that the message was being spread, and that it wasn't, as you said, being fired. Soon, Peter and John and all the others would travel around the world to preach the gospel. The church leadership had called Philip and said, you're, you're going to be a deacon. Here's your job. The Hellenist women need food. Make sure they get food every day. You and six others, that's your job. But he did way much, way more, right? He worked where God pushed him and led him. He didn't dig in his heels and say, that's not my job. My job is to make sure the old ladies get food. He didn't dig in his heels and say, that's my job. He took every advantage of every opportunity. I was praying on Thursday morning with a couple of friends. One of them said that his prayer for he and his church was that they would have the opportunity in the COVID pandemic to serve God. That they would have an opportunity to serve God during the pandemic. Not just an opportunity, but that they would recognize the opportunity and how they could use COVID to present the gospel. What opportunities are you seeing God presenting to you? Do a little assessment of since we gathered last week together till today. Do a little assessment of your last week. 
How many opportunities did God present to you to share your faith in Jesus? How many of those opportunities did you actually recognize and then move on? Or did you dig in your heels and say, that's not my job? As I worked through this passage, the Lord kept bringing back to my mind last Sunday morning. I told you I'd really struggled to get the message written last week for various reasons. Not the least of was my own personal computer issue. When I had my my morning Bible reading and prayer last Sunday morning, I I confessed to God that I didn't feel like I was prepared to deliver a message. So I asked God to deliver His message through me because I wasn't capable. Same thing happened today because of all the issues we had. Several of you told me last week that it was a really good message. The bar is pretty low. So you, you told me it was a good message. God was working through me, and it wasn't me, because I had no capability last week. just need to understand that. I also prayed last Sunday morning that we would have a visitor. I had no idea that Sybil was coming. I had no idea. And as I was sitting here, looked up from my computer screen, and I saw her walk in and sit down, and I didn't know who she was. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know how she got here. And then God said, hey, stupid. She got here because you asked for a visitor. God can do more than we can dream of. Understand that what Paul says there. No matter what you can dream of, God can do more. You can't imagine all that God can do. We need to be busy serving God through our life and ministry, taking advantage of every opportunity, not knowing what will come from that opportunity. When Philip agreed to be a deacon, I don't think he had the understanding that he was going to lead Samaria to Christ. He thought he'd be waiting on tables for Jewish ladies. Even when we don't have the strength, physical or mental, to do what he wants us to do, he gives us the strength. Philip was appointed to wait tables, but was used by God to bring the gospel to Samaria. Peter and John were used by God to authenticate the conversions of an entire city, and were so excited to do it that they kept skipping on their way home, preaching the gospel all the way back to Jerusalem. What's God got in store for you? What opportunity is He going to give you? What opportunity are you going to see and take advantage of? Thank you, Father. For the reality of your word. Thank you for the examples, for the principles that we see in your text. Now, Philip didn't dig his heels in and say, no, that's not not my job to, to lead people to Christ. I have to wait on tables. But he chose to follow you. Take advantage of the opportunity. Thank you, Father, for that. Thank you that Peter and John weren't successful in calling down fire on the Samaritans, but were successful in keeping the Holy Spirit. Father, this week, give us the opportunities Give us the sight of the opportunity. Give us the courage and the energy to follow up on them. And to see men and women, boys and girls, come to know you. Thank you, Father, for loving us. Thank you for all that you do for us. We love you and we want to serve you. We want to be your slaves in every way that we can. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. 
Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.